we're already at the limits of what can be done with classical engineering. The true challenge, for example, circuit optimization, traveling salesman, if these are the domain of artificial intelligence, which I believe they are, then we need quantum computing. Welcome to the MMC Ventures podcast. We're going beyond the hype in artificial intelligence. A warm welcome to listeners. I'm David Kellner, partner and head of research at MMC Ventures, the insight-led venture capital firm based in London. In this six-part series, we'll be hearing deep insights from some of the world's leading AI technologists, entrepreneurs, and corporate executives, while keeping things accessible for the non-specialist. I think AI is today's most important enabling technology, but it's not easy to separate fact from fiction. My goal for this series is for us to come away better informed about the reality of AI today, what's to come, and how to take advantage. It's a pleasure today to welcome Ilias Khan, KSG, co-founder and CEO of Cambridge Quantum Computing, I think one of the world's most exciting companies in the field of quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Today, I'd like to explore the impact of quantum computing on AI. But to do that, we need to understand the basics of quantum computing. We'll break, therefore, with our usual format today and take the first half of today's episode to hear an accessible introduction to quantum computing from Ilias. Ilias has an impressive CV, to put it mildly. In addition to his commercial achievements, Ilias is a fellow of St. Edmund's College at the University of Cambridge and leader in residence at the Judge Business School, where he established the school's highly regarded business accelerator program focused on the technology sector. Ilias also serves as chairman and founding trustee of the Stephen Hawking Foundation and is a life member of the American Mathematical Society. Not that he told me this, but I did also find out that Ilias supports a lot of philanthropic initiatives, including development of public access programs for the publishing and peer review of scientific academic papers. And in his spare time, of which I can't imagine this very much, Ilias is a specialist on the philosopher Wittgenstein and has lectured and published numerous papers on the subject. Ilias, a very warm welcome and thank you for today. No, thank you. Good to be here. This series is sponsored by Barclays. I asked Barclays for a strapline they'd like to include as sponsor. And I thought their response was really interesting. Quote, thanks, but I'm not sure about slogans. Here's just how we think about AI. We think AI is incredibly important, a whole new field that's as significant as anything that's gone before. We think AI is vital to our business and we're working hard to take advantage of it for our customers. And we need to learn from and collaborate with a wide range of people to ensure success. Technology advances fastest, not when it's held close, but when people get out, listen and contribute. I thought that was better than any slogan, so I asked if we might run with that. I have pleasure in doing so. Before we begin, I'd highlight to listeners that I'm a small shareholder in Cambridge Quantum Computing. Ilias, could we begin by having you explain for the non-specialist, what is quantum computing? To set the premise, why don't we take a step back and think of the most powerful computer that we can imagine? And don't think of what it computes or how it computes. Think of what it might do. And depending upon your field and your interest, you might think of, uh, for example, decoding the genome, or you might think of sentient intelligence, or you might think of computers that can find prime factors in a blink of an eye. It doesn't matter what it is. Just imagine the most powerful computer that you can think of. Now, once you've got that in your mind, then imagine that there are another million of them next to each other. And then take a step back and wave your wand and imagine that you multiply that by a billion. Now that, in a sense, is what we're talking about, except with the added factor that quantum computing effectively is a way that nature computes. And whether or not we believe in multiverses, which is a little bit um, controversial, the fact of the matter is that the rules of quantum mechanics are different from the rules of everyday macroscopic life. And a quantum computer is powerful because it works and is worked on the basis of the rules and laws of quantum mechanics. You alluded to the fact that quantum computers work not by conventional rules, but using or taking advantage of the laws of nature, the laws of quantum mechanics, the rules of the the microscopic. Could you tell us a little bit about how that works in the sense of traditional computers work using binary-based transistors and ones and zeros and binary methods of data storage? Can you tell us a little how those rules of nature differ or what it means to take advantage of quantum properties that are the basis of quantum computing? 
Yes, and one quick caveat before I do that. There is absolutely no reason for people to be mystified by quantum computing. Let's remember at all times that this is a device. It's an actual engineered device. It is built and created by human beings and therefore capable of being understood in the most basic terms. And when we talk about classical machines, which obviously took root um, on a logical basis that was invented or thought of or created by Turing, we came up with this idea of binary decisions, which then got translated into these vacuum tubes, which in turn got translated into transistors that you and I are familiar with. And the miniaturization of that process is clearly what has led to amazing advances in the last 40 years. Now, that basis, the classical basis, so I'm going to talk about existing computers as being classical computers, as you rightly point out, um, is embedded on this solid foundation that we now take for granted, which is that no matter how complex the information, it can be coded using a binary system. So whether it's a streaming video or whether it's a photograph or an email or even an extremely complicated AI procedure, it ultimately is a set of instructions that are coded. However, at the quantum mechanical level, because the rules are different, and I'll explain the two key rules that matter in a second, we don't have to do that. And the two rules that really matter and which mark the boundary between classical computing, which in obviously my opinion is very contrived, you know, we didn't suddenly wake up and find that this is the way we're going to do it. It's a contrived methodology based on the Turing approach. Um, in quantum mechanics, we have discovered um, about 100 years ago now um, that atomic and subatomic particles um, obey the laws of quantum mechanics and therefore exhibit two particular traits. One is called quantum superposition and the other one is called quantum entanglement. Now, I won't go into the um, uh, physics of, of, of those theories, but the bottom line here is that a qubit, which is the measure of data, it is how we store, encode, manipulate, and compute. So it's equivalent of the transistor. At the quantum mechanical level, a qubit can be zero or one and all points in between simultaneously. And that uses that property of superposition in the quantum world to achieve that? Or is that a different property? No, that is in fact superposition. Um, when we look at quantum mechanics and we have studied now the, when I say we, we, we humankind, we academia, we research laboratories, we governments, quantum mechanics is one of the most, um, thoroughly experimentally proven, um, theorems in, in actually in, in humankind right now. Um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of experiments have taken place, uh, perhaps actually more, um, to prove what I'm now describing to you. And the quantum mechanical property of a electron or a photon or a single atom is that it cannot be measured accurately if one uh, wishes at any given point to trace its whereabouts. And the reason for that um, is that it occupies all states at the same time, which we call superposition. Now, when we talk about quantum computers, when we use qubits to compute, we benefit from that quality. So we can actually break free from binary computing. I hadn't really thought about it before, but binary computing is not only not a law of nature, it's it's the opposite. The way nature works is distinctly non-binary. So what could we actually achieve if we compute that way? Yes, um, we all have our different eureka moments. Yeah. Um, and when we look out at nature, na na nature is obviously a catch-all phrase. I mean, what are we really talking about? So let's zero in on something that happens all the time, uh, which is photosynthesis. Right. And we, we look at the most basic um, properties of plants, which don't think about how they're going to convert sunlight into carbohydrates and energy and, and everything else. Yes. Um, it just happens. And of course, if we try to simulate that, using computers, classical computers, we would first translate it into some sort of a language that we understand. Then we translate it into this binary code, and then we'd run it, and of course, we'd get back gobbledygook because it's not the way nature computes. Whereas 
quantum mechanics and therefore quantum computing is in fact nature's way of computing. And if you like, when you think of quantum computing, I would encourage you to think of finally arriving at this place that we were always meant to arrive at. Yes, it does seem like traditional binary computing was a first stepping stone on the path to both understanding, but also using nature's processes to figure out nature itself. Correct. And the and quantum computing is also a relatively recent addition to our lexicon. Um, the terminology came about uh, towards the end of the 1970s and the early 1980s. There's a fabulous book by um, Richard Feynman, um, Feynman on Computation, his lectures, that took place in 1982. Um And at that time, Feynman was looking at various um, challenges in existing classical computing. And obviously, he turned around and said, well, actually, if we're going to understand nature, then let's compute using the laws of nature, quantum mechanics. But I don't think he ever dreamt of a time so close to, to the time that he lived when the engineering would be possible for us to achieve that end. It was always very, very speculative. You mentioned two properties of the quantum world that we take advantage of in the era of quantum computing. One is um, quantum superposition, the other is quantum entanglement. I think you described how quantum superposition is so important because it enables us to record and and manipulate data in a non-binary way and take advantage of that property. How does quantum entanglement come into all this? I don't think there's a human being alive who can answer that question. Uh, Einstein died trying to understand and figure it out. There are uh, libraries of uh, it's debate. It's kind of famously an unsolved problem, isn't it? Or it's an unsolved, old, unsolved. It's uh, yeah. I wouldn't say so. So um, John Bell, um, a Northern Irish um, physicist, a very brilliant physicist, um, conducted a series of experiments which uh, proved beyond doubt that entanglement is real and can be exhibited. So we know enough um, about the um, underlying properties to be able to recreate them in an experimental form. So it's not that we can't exhibit them, it's actually that we can't explain them. Right. And the reason we can't explain them is perhaps not uh, for this um, um, interview, but let me answer your question more directly. And I would encourage your readers um, to perhaps, if they want to take a deeper plunge, um, go on to the internet and just type quantum entanglement and it's a whole new world that opens up which is absolutely captivating it is the deepest mystery of the universe there's no question about that Um, so quantum entanglement is the curious property of subatomic particles and uh, as I've said atoms and in some cases groups of atoms in certain conditions where if you imagine that you have two electrons they are separated shall we say Uh, by a distance which is millions of light years, by looking at one, let's say that it encodes a piece of information, let's, for the sake of argument, say it can either say red or black. So both um, the electrons have been encoded with either red or black as the information. By looking at one, you immediately know the property of the other millions of light years away. So it's action at a distance is the phenomenon that we can't explain. The action, that's right, the non-locality yes. um, is is what puzzles us. And, and of course, things cannot, general relativity tells us, things don't go faster than light. Yeah. But this amazing property, um, uh, well, it's a law really of quantum mechanics, can be exploited. And what it means is that when we build uh, quantum machines, uh, uh, such as have been built, and I suspect we'll get onto that later on in this conversation about where we are in the state of the art, we can benefit from both superposition and quantum entanglement and therefore compute in a manner that is absolutely unrivaled. It's not only unrivaled, it's not even a comparison with existing classical computing. And the reason why people are very excited about quantum computing is it means that things that we previously could not imagine doing become possible today. What types of problems could we solve with quantum computers that we can't solve with traditional approaches? 
We have a pretty good idea of some of the things that will be possible. And I'll give you a couple of very obvious and clear examples. But I would say that like all amazing technologies, it's only once they come into existence that smart people like you and uh, many of the people, I guess, dare say, who are listening into this, um, into this podcast will have the brilliance to think of use cases that simply don't exist today. And I truly think that the vast majority of the ways in which quantum computers will be used is ahead of us. So therefore, what is it that we know um, uh, can be done uh, with a quantum computer that is hard or impossible with classical computers? I think it's not hyperbole um, to think of the impact of quantum computing as comparable to the impact that we as humans and our dads and granddads and their granddads before them felt because of what happened at the Industrial Revolution when machines took over tasks that human beings found difficult or perhaps when computers first came onto the scene. The two examples that I'm about to give are the most um, um, used examples for a reason. It's because they've been proven. One is the ability to crack mathematical codes that existing computers cannot crack. When we look at RSA, uh, which is the methodology used to encrypt messages, we have looked at ways in which public keys that are exchanged are exchanged using very large numbers for which the prime factors have to be found or supplied before the key can be unlocked. The reason for that is that if we have very large numbers, existing computers find it very, very, very difficult to find uh, uh, the, the underlying prime factors. And in fact, there's a really interesting page on the Microsoft website, Microsoft Quantum Computing, where they give an example of RSA 2048, which using classical computers, the most powerful supercomputer available today, it could take approximately a billion years to crack, where with a modest quantum computer, it might take less than a minute. And that is a real fact. There's nothing made up about that. We can debate as to whether that's going to happen next month, next year, or in five years' time, or ten years' time. But the fact is a quantum computer will be able to do that. Now, that is a class of problems that are MP-hard for those of your listeners that are interested in computational complexity. And the significance of that is that this is only one example, therefore, of what can be done. If you can crack... Um, prime factors, a whole world of new problems becomes available. And the reason for that is even in classical computing, as you know, uh, virtually all problems are, clo uh, are, are the same handful of algorithms wearing different clothes. It's the same class of problems. Yes. The other example that um, is very often used um, is this search function. Um, and if you go on a number of these um, websites or papers that are written for the accessible market, uh, the non-specialist market, um, people talk about a dictionary or a telephone directory and somebody's looking for Kelnar. And at the moment, no matter what you do, it is A followed by B followed by C, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a number of steps that are measured and measurable um, to see how quickly and how efficiently that search can be accomplished. In a quantum computer, primarily because of both the superposition quality that we mentioned earlier, and of course entanglement, but primarily superposition, these tasks are the equivalent of something happening simultaneously. Now, this is a very, very hard concept to grasp because simultaneity in our human perception is not something we can ever understand. We can't even describe it. So those are two examples of problems. And again, similarly, uh, you know, I'd like to point out that just because you can, it's not very exciting to find Kelnar in a dictionary, but for the same reason you can do that quicker than a classical computer, there's a whole family of issues that then opens up that you can resolve. Just briefly, what are the main challenges in developing quantum computing? Is it more in the mathematics? Is it more in the hardware engineering or predominantly the software development? Well, right now, the machines that are being developed, let's focus on the actual devices the for hardware, a second. Yeah. 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 The hardware, correct. 
Um, so I'm so used to calling them machines, and it becomes second nature to me. But but yes, hardware. That's I'm now talking to a computer scientist. I can tell, <laughs> um, and there is a hardware software divide. Um, no, I'm very much in the same camp uh, as Microsoft and Google and IBM um, and a host of other people who have decided um, and proven that this is currently an engineering challenge. And that tipping point probably happened at some point during 2014 and 2015. And the advances that we witness today, David, are a result of the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent, uh, billions in fact, um, in the last few years. And of course, where we will get to over the course of the next two, three, five, six years um, is a reflection of the enormous resource that's being poured into this. And I'll come back to the corporate priorities in a minute. But when you ask me what the challenges are, there are engineering challenges. And in a nutshell, um, the core challenges are how do we now create more than a handful of qubits. So if you go back to the late 1940s and 50s and imagine that you're in Princeton and imagine that you um, were friends with Oppenheimer and he took you to the computer, ENIVAC, I think perhaps it was called, or UNIVAC, I get mixed up between the two, and you went into this big room with about 20 vacuum tubes and it could add up two and two if you came back in an hour. You know, that's sort of, you know, we've gone past that stage. And now we're thinking of how can we have more than X number of qubits. And that's about how do you generate these qubits. Remember, com quantum cu computing is about generating, manipulating, and measuring qubits. And qubits, unlike classical computing, are physical objects. You know, these are not transistor gates that are open or closed. These are real things. They're either photons or electrons or atoms. So there are different ways in which we can generate, manipulate and measure. And some people do it through superconducting. Some people have iron traps. So one of the challenges is how do you scale the numbers of qubits? And in um, just uh, betraying how incompetent I am, in January 2015, I wrote a blog piece um, talking about progress in this area, and I was hopelessly out of date. Today, IBM have public access to a machine of 16 qubits, which in 2015 was something that was unheard of. We, we were thinking at least 2020. Of course, we didn't know what IBM was doing behind the scenes. Google have proclaimed that they will smash quantum supremacy this calendar year. And just for the benefit of listeners, am I... Correct in saying that quantum supremacy doesn't mean perhaps what people might think, which is kind of leadership in this field. It means the first time that a quantum computer will perform a task that a traditional computer is unable to do. Is that incorrect? Yes, I, th I think there are two aspects to that. Can I, David, come back to that in a second? Mm. But just to finish on the challenge. Yeah. So one is the, the scaling of qubits. And I won't forget about quantum supremacy. It's a really good question. Um, and whoever was involved in the PR of that phrase is probably regretting ever having come up with it. And I think it's very right for you to ask that because when the announcement is made, as it will be made, um, it's important to be very measured about how we respond to it. Um, so one scaling. The second is these things are transient objects and they decohere very quickly. So we have already increased decoherence times a 100,000 fold in the last three or four years which means that we can have deeper circuits. Each qubit can go through a number of operations because remember there are gates in these circuits, just like there are gates in, um, in classical computing. So that's the second challenge. And then the non-hardware challenge is how do you make sense of them? What's the operating system? How do you compile them? How do you uh, allow accessibility to high-level languages. What are the algorithms at work? So these are the three areas, two on the hardware side, one on the software side. So David, as you know, because you've been on the mailing list um, for a lot of the material that Cambridge Quantum has been sending out to its shareholders, almost every week since about February, there's a new disclosure about somebody somewhere making advances on the engineering side or the algorithm side. And in January of 2014, there were five credible projects which were well-funded 
and had the depth, the bench depth of engineering to build a quantum computer. Today, I keep a log, there are at least 17, three of them in Britain. Shall I now go back to quantum supremacy for a second? I'd love to. I, I think you're spot on, actually. Uh, I, I, there's nothing I can do to, to um, better the, the, the definition that you used. Um, I think that quantum supremacy is not, uh, as far as Google is concerned, and I'm not a corporate person there, I think there is a little bit of, um, of corporate achievement. I, I think Google would love to be the first to achieve that supremacy, that milestone. And it is a milestone that's very meaningful because it establishes that there is a quantum computer in existence that can do things faster and more accurately than a classical computer can do and do so in a manner that is relevant to our everyday lives and is repeatable. So it's not a one-off fluke. Because it's very easy to design an experiment and say, oh, well, you know, my son can beat Usain Bolt because, you know, I shoved him and for the first half a meter, he went to 88 miles an hour. Well, of course he did because I shoved him, but he didn't do the next 99 and a half meters, right? Yeah. So we, 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 there's been a lot of, um, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but some, some companies, particularly in early 2016, were guilty of a lot of arm waving. And so I think Google and others um, have taken leadership and have established the rules um, for what constitutes quantum supremacy. Now, as I say, I think it's a little bit of a geeky terminology and the geeks didn't quite understand the impact that this would have in the real world. Right. Because when you say anything supremacy, it comes across It sounds across pretty as, punchy, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, I appreciate capability comes by degree and you've talked about the startling growth in qubit capability that's perhaps exceeded even your own um, expectations. But I, I guess kind of the, the billion dollar question, in how many years will we have a quantum computer that can run practical applications? So what I'll do is I'll describe the consensus and then we'll just touch on a couple of outliers. I would advise dividing this into three bits. Now the consensus is that we are currently in a state where quantum computers, the gate-based computers that can be programmed um, for ultimate universal um, um, application, are so-called shallow circuit. This means that there are two properties which constrain them from um, doing all kinds of things. One property is that there's a relatively small number of qubits. Secondly, um, that they, they are not error corrected. Because of the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics and something we didn't touch upon when we talked about the machines, and I think probably not something that we need to worry about too much in this podcast, there will be a need, there is a need for some degree of error correction. Now, this is, we, we take this for granted in our existing computers. There are errors. There are circuit errors or electronic errors. There are all kinds of environmental hazards, but we don't notice them because in the one time out of a billion that there's an error, it then gets corrected. Yes. So in the early days of quantum computing without error correction, and let's talk about machines that are over the next, should we say, two to five years going to reach circuit sizes, which are measured with a few hundred qubits and with two gate, uh, two qubit gate fidelities of 998 and 999. Remember, we need to get to four nines. We need to get to 99.9999 to really crack things. Um, there are a, a, a number of things which are practically useful. And quantum chemistry and applications in quantum chemistry, the synthesis, the synthesis of new materials, for example, is something that classical computers cannot do. And it is believed that a modest size computer in this early category will be able to do. Now, that's completely practical for all kinds of reasons, which will already have a major impact on our lives. The next stage after that, we're looking at things like optimization, the things you're interested in, AI, and we need a combination of more qubits, better gate fidelities, which implies either a quantum computer that doesn't need error correcting, such as the Microsoft project, and I'll come back to that, because that could blow everything out of the water, or better techniques 
at compiling inefficient quantum algorithms that takes into account non-error correcting formats. And there's a lot of work now happening there. But absent that work being successful, or Microsoft blowing everybody out of the water, then I think in that period, let's just say three to seven years, just give us a wide berth there, things like optimization suddenly become accessible. These big uh, prime factor um, solutions, which obviously are a big yes. threat to encryption, come into play. And then we talk about things like traveling salesman problem, which of course have been beyond our reach. You know, ever since we've had computers, and I think the, the end game, I think there's a very strong consensus that in the seven to 10 year time frame, which is not very long, seven years was 2010, right? You make me feel old now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but corporates work on three to five right. year budgets. You know, yes. for them, it's, uh, you know, I was listening this morning to the um, decision to build that, you know, road um, across Stonehenge. And it's not going to be ready by till 2026. Yes. By the time that's ready, what I'm now describing will already be ancient history. Um, but then you have universality. You have a quantum computer that is universal in the sense that it can do anything and everything that a quantum computer really should. And yes. that's dreamland. And whether it's seven years or 15 years, frankly, it doesn't matter because this is journey. We didn't get these smartphones in 1994 you know, we had, we had this journey. But what is clear to me is that that timeline, the risk in that timeline is on the upside, not the downside. I'm notoriously cautious. Uh, every time I've made a prediction, I've been wrong in the last four years, and I dare say I'll be wrong again. So on what is probably a relatively prudent set of expectations, you think that starting from maybe 48 months time from now, we will start to have quantum computers that have measurable and useful applications in certain areas in ways that were not possible before? Uh, short answer, yes. And perhaps even earlier than 48 months. Um, so look, I think that we need to divide this. I would advise dividing this into three bits. First of all, quantum technologies. I think that governments and large organizations around the world have decided that you cannot wait for a quantum processor to crack your means of encryption and that new investment has to be quantum resistant. So um, we won't go into this area of, of, of cyber currencies, which is the most obvious example um, of, of, of where deep encryption um, meets the public. Um, and if you don't mind, I think we maybe do a side shimmy across blockchain. But if you think about things that governments worry about, defense, security, then you have to be quantum resistant. And yes. that means that the methods by which you encrypt messages either have to be quantum mechanical in nature or a new solution has to be found. Now, those quantum technologies are available today. It is entirely possible to build um, a small device um, about the size of maybe a, an old-fashioned telephone or your laptop, um, maybe a little bit heavier, that generates um, uh, entangled photons that in turn generate randomness, that in turn form the basis for encryption. So I think that is going to happen already, that, that we're not waiting 48 months. And in fact, I think government um, directives will mean that certification standards will come into place for quantum random number generation. Beyond that, there are things like quantum gravity sensors. Um, and these have got military uses. And I think there is clearly a lot of work. And it's uh, quantum metrology is a broad um, area of work. And one of the fantastic things that the UK government did way back now when we um, came up with quantum hubs is we do have a lead here in this country, um, which is tangible in these areas. Then we come to early stage quantum computers. And I think my view is that, um, you know, it's perfectly right for people to challenge me and say, well, okay, what's the timeline? So I think that on the basis of everything we know today, and the investment that's going into this sector by Christmas of 2019, you know, by the time we took into our Turkey, there will be a few hundred, if not thousands, of organizations and people who benefit from quantum computing delivered to them remotely 
in high performance clusters where it would be impossible to differentiate where that boundary on whatever solution is being delivered can be found. It may only be modest and it may be delivered by people such as IBM and Google, but it will not be trivial. Just talk me through a little bit likely government and, and company response. So is, is the response that we then either need to use quantum methodologies to derive new forms of encryption? Or as I think was the phrase you used, was it quantum resistance or quantum hardening or some way of yeah. hardening existing systems using quantum approach? I think in encryption, I think we can be pretty straightforward in the answer. There's really no reason for guesswork. And, you know, David, I said earlier, I'm all about demystifying things, taking the unnecessary baggage away from these things. So here in the United Kingdom, it is very, very clear that the governmental authorities have made a distinction between hardening or enhancing classical methodologies of quantum resistance versus being truly quantum and therefore quantum proof. And that tipping point has happened this summer. Um, there's no question that the government has to take a lead on these things. For example, if there are competing uh, suppliers of so-called quantum randomness, how do we know, how does the consumer know that one works and the other one is just a magic box? So these standards of certification have to be generated by the government and these will be the stepping stone so that future methods of encryption are indeed quantum and not simply quantum resistant. And one of the obvious reasons for that is that when you've got assets in the field, let's, let's talk about the electricity grid, let's talk about information to protect um, from, let's say, adversarial bad people taking down the grid. You can't every month or every year replace um, that infrastructure. What you put into place has to have longevity. Has to and the only guarantee that we have um, it, it is for it to be quantum in nature. So quantum random number generation is the future and we can faff around at the sides and people can hide their heads in the sand and pretend to be ostriches, <laughs> but there's really no question. And quantum random number generation is so important because it's a key to then, if you like, quantum native encryption, true quantum encryption. Correct. So therefore, um, it's like that old, um, I'm betraying my age now, but we used to have Captain Scarlet when I was a kid growing up. And, Captain uh, Scarlet was awesome. <laughs> so if, uh, you know, if this message will self-destruct. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it, 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 it requires that degree um, of security. So, for example, um, quantum informa information, if interfered with, simply dissolves and um, n n n nobody is yet, and I don't think anybody ever will break the rules of quantum mechanics, and so therefore you're safe. Um you know, the, one of the motivating factors here is that, um, you know, I jokingly mentioned uh, Microsoft, but, you know, we're talking at the moment about um, times to deliver quantum processors that are error corrected of, let's say, somewhere between five, if you're madly optimistic, and 10 years. Well, of course, if next year or the year after Microsoft actually deliver a topological qubit that doesn't require error correction, all these bets are out the window, right? And there's another project I'm aware with, which is from the Oxford um, University Computer Science Department. And they're looking at um, a new methodology for being much more efficient in compiling algorithms on different platforms. Well, if you're 50% more efficient, should we say, and you suddenly find that 50 natural qubits doesn't equal five logical it suddenly equals 10, for example, you're on a different trajectory. And I think governments and large organizations can no longer take the risk, and, and what I'm telling you is what they've already decided, um, that we miss out on this issue. Now, I'm not going to, for example, it's very easy to point to China or Russia. I think China and Russia share the same concerns. So I think it's a global uh, attempt to try and just be prudent. Should we talk a bit about the impact of quantum computing on artificial intelligence? Perhaps let me start with a rather open-ended question. How do you think quantum computing will impact artificial intelligence? You know, I, I'm very firmly in the, um, in the camp of having been educated um, on this over the course of the last two years. 
and the body of work that supports what I'm about to say is deep and rich and constantly evolving. And the narrative goes something like this. We're already at the limits of what can be done with classical engineering. We can tweak architectures here. We can speed things up there. There might be a better GPU. There might be something that helps um, network depth and obviously the impact on unsupervised learning therefore comes about. And there might be clever people that program something to be a better Go player or a better Jeopardy player or a Netflix reminder. But the true challenge, for example, um, circuit optimization, traveling salesman, if these are the domain of artificial intelligence, which I believe they are, and if we're really talking about anything approaching um, circuit depths that are somewhat natural rather than plastic contrived, then we need something that's not classical computing. And it's not just about Moore's law. The ability of a quantum computer to achieve that stage and go beyond, and I'm now not talking about sentient machines or anything like that, I'm just talking about actual artificial intelligence in the way that we all hope will happen, then a quantum computer already is provably superior. The challenge for quantum computing, actually, uh, and I've already previously given timescales, so I think it's good to be conservative. You know, I don't think there's anything going to happen in the next two years. Of course, we may wake up next January and find I'm wrong. Um, we have a project ourselves. Um, there's a fantastic paper that was published last week by Alejandro Ortiz and Marcello Benedetti on the subject which I'm about to um, describe, which is a combination, a duality of using classical data storage methodologies in partnership with quantum um, computing analytics. Because one of the issues in the past has been how do you store data in a quantum form? Because you solve one problem and obviously have another. It's equally clear that quantum uh, memory will evolve and that it, there's a lot of resource being poured into that by all the people that you can imagine. So we store data in atoms or subatomic atomic subatomic particles, etc. So that both the an analytics and computation is in the same form as the data. But until we get to that stage, um, it's likely that because these machines are now available, these quantum computers are now available, experiment on some interesting machine learning application, particularly unsupervised um, stuff, um, neural networks for the want of a better word, replication of those and making them enhanced will proceed apace. My view is, um, David, on this, that the, the, the real work that breaks the back of it is, is, is ahead of us. But certainly within a two-year time frame, we will be looking at things that today are simply impossible to imagine. If, of course, we talk about quantum memory, then I think we're rightfully looking at a five-year plus time scale to, to have those technologies enhanced. Just to ensure we, we keep this accessible for folks, um, some of the very tangible kind of down-to-earth day-to-day ways that quantum computing can be used for AI there's a big piece around, I presume, just speeding up the pace at which neural networks, artificial neural networks, can be trained. So I think that one of the very obvious areas um, is, is the analysis of complex patterns embedded within time series. And those time series can be anything. Um, they can be as trivial as share prices, and they can be as complex as weather patterns. And it, it, in a 24-month timescale, I think we will be able to recognize, interpret, and classify um, by some order of magnitude um, with more accuracy, magnitude of accuracy and speed, um, patterns that are at the moment ad hoc in time series that are very complex. And that will be done by aligning um, classical memory with uh, this unsupervised learning that takes place in neural networks using quantum algorithms. That speed up will be tangible. 
and measurable. Now, the application of that, some people might want to trade <laughs> currencies with it. Yes. Others might want to analyze, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, consumer behavior. Um, and the constraint there, as I've said before, will be data set. What, you won't break the back of this. We won't break the back of this until the data itself is in a is stored in a quantum form. So if one of the key benefits of machine learning today is the ability to find more subtle patterns in data, um, over the next 24 months, one of the benefits of quantum algorithms will be their ability to improve the accuracy of the patterns that can be found. And then longer term, the even bigger shift comes when you start using quantum memory and other more structural elements to apply to AI. Yes, so I, I, I don't think you're oversimplifying it, David. I, I think there's a rightful caution about trying to put timelines to these things, and I, yes. and I respect that. I think it's, a, it's right to be grounded. But I think this is probably one of the few areas in this conversation where I would actually encourage a little bit of um, you know, people to be brave and, and ambitious. You know, I think the history of what we've learned over the last three years is that things will happen quicker. And my recommendation to people is not just to think of um, a greater subtlety or accuracy in pattern classification. So asking direct questions of data, and that question could be a binary question, yes or no, should I do this or should I do that, is probably the least of the achievements that will be um, measurable in this next period. What I think will actually happen is that the dream of AI where we begin to replicate not necessarily emotion, but human behavior so that we can be a better, let's say, service provider to our human audience. Or in the case of, um, for example, diagnostics, and I'm now thinking about healthcare, there's a major bottleneck in triage, for example, in health provision. And that is something where we can look forward with some optimism to enhancements. Some of them might, in the short term, actually be primarily driven by classical data sets with some support vector um, speed up, for example. But I, I would be more ambitious, I would say, just on this last bit. And I think it's fine to take a few risks and be a little bit ambitious here. Um, certainly one thing... Um, uh, is, is clear, a very large amount of resource is being shoved into this and it will come up with results. This is not ad hoc. This is not a group of people, you know, I don't know, in, in London or in Berkeley. This is an organised Oh, yeah. This sector is, effort. Yeah, a governmental and corporate driven. There are people whose livelihoods now revolve around these very tangible measures. I'd come back to that paper there are two papers that you really i would recommend to your audience and they're not you know they're a little bit specialist but they're well worth the effort one is by simone severini he's one of a number of authors but if you go to the archive and um, google simone severini uh, quantum machine learning an introduction and if you then look at um, alejandro ortiz quantum assisted machine learning i think you'll get a really decent sense of what is and isn't possible. Both those pieces of major research were partially sponsored by us, but also people like IARPA and DARPA um, were co-sponsors, uh, NASA as well. So this is not trivial stuff. This is not two people in a garage messing yeah. around. This is well-resourced and considered effort. Yeah. And just finally, is there any reason to believe that quantum computing will help address the so-called challenge of explainability around today's artificial neural networks, whereby we know they work well, but we can't always look inside them to know how they arrived at the recommendation they did? Will quantum computing help, uh, or is the problem here more about the nature of artificial neural networks themselves? So really, it's the second time I've been asked that question today, actually. Um, <laughs> although you're asking it is a lot more articulate than the time I was asked earlier this morning, uh, with all due apologies to the person who asked this morning, who might be listening. Um, yeah, I think, I think you're spot on there, David. I think there is an element um, of unnecessary um, confusion because of the way that we've sort of jerry-rigged existing network um, algorithms onto this binary sort of on-off, uh, even with the fantastic NVIDIA GPUs that we all benefit from um, that parallel transport these same instruction sets. Um, 
I think a lot of that will will go away. And and this ideal, you know, when you might ask a question in the same way that we talk to Alexa and accept the question won't be, please, can you play the Beach Boys? It'll be something far more profound, gets answered without any intermediation, which is ultimately what artificial intelligence is about, becomes a lot more intuitive because we do work within the laws of nature rather than some horrible abacus-like intermediary. I think that, therefore, the language has yet to emerge. I don't know what it will be, but I think it will be a lot more intuitive. And if we take the example of this 2026 forecast, you know, by the time that the road is complete across Stonehenge... um, I think it seems a fitting metaphor somehow in (laughs) in terms of changing history. (laughs) Yeah, it's a blink of an eyelid, isn't it? Um, I think at that point in time, we will have machines. What's that, nine years from now? Look, I think we, we, we could even be on the threshold of a few million qubit at that point in time. Who knows? And certainly error correction ought to be well within our grasp. And if you're a Microsoft shareholder, then you're hoping that they're the ones that build the topological qubit yeah. because a trillion dollar market cap will be a distant view in the rear mirror if they pull that off. On that bombshell, briefly, actually, if I may, um, you're a Wittgenstein scholar, so you're about the only person I could ever ask this to. What do you think Wittgenstein would have made of AI and quantum computing? Well, I think he was ahead of the curve and his most famous aphorism, he was full of aphorisms, is whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. So he would have maintained a very knowing silence. But on a more serious note, I do think that there are points at which vocabulary runs out. But I don't think this is one of those occasions. You know, I can talk to you about a Bach cantata or maybe something closer to home for me. I'm a big Sibelius fan. I could never put into words... You know, the other day I was in front of a Rothko, I went down to the Tate Modern, and I always go and sit and get consumed by that. Um, These are things that can't be put in the words. But what you and I are talking about now are physical things. They should not be mystical, and they're completely within our grasp. It is, Khan. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this series of MMC Ventures Beyond the Hype podcast, presented in association with Barclays. We've really enjoyed producing this for you. Follow us on Twitter at MMC underscore ventures and explore our research at mmcventures.com. Don't miss series two of Beyond the Hype AI, where we'll hear more incredible insights from the world's leading AI entrepreneurs, corporate executives and technologists.